So, good evening, and a warm welcome to you all on this very chilly evening. Uh, my name is Mark Searcy, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Science. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to put my glasses on now because I forgot to put them on. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us for our first inaugural lecture of the spring term. Uh, it's great to be here this evening. Welcome to those of you joining here in the, uh, welcome you also to those of you joining uh, online via YouTube. Thank you for taking part, and please do let us know in the chat where you're watching from. I'd also like to welcome our speaker for this evening, Professor Grant Wheeler. Grant is a professor in cell and develop developmental biology in the UEA School of Biological Sciences. His first degree was in biochemistry at King's College London 35 years ago, ages you a bit. Um, he subsequently did a PhD in cell biology at the National Institute for Medical Research in North London, where he was studying de desmosome cell junctions. Following his PhD, he did his first postdoc in the laboratory of Professor Richard Hines at MIT in Boston, Massachusetts. This was funded by a competitive Anna Fuller Fellowship. He then returned to the UK and continued his interest in cell biology, working, the de working in the Department of Anatomy and Physiology at the University of Dundee. At this time, he also began research on embryo development, essentially cell biology in the whole organism. Grant was appointed in 2001 as a lecturer at UEA. He became senior lecturer in 2010, a reader in 2015, and was promoted to chair in 2019. His research involves studying the development of whole organisms. To do this, he's using the Xenopus, or the African clawed frog, as his model system. Using the frog, his research in recent years has provided insights into vertebrate neural crest biology, cancer biology, and drug development. But basically, he studies tadpoles. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Grant Wheeler to give his inaugural lecture. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark, for introducing me. So I'm assuming everybody can hear me. That's good. Great. So let's just uh, raise the pointer up. Okay, so uh, I think today I'm going to be fairly light on the science and kind of just give you an idea of the things that I've done down through the years. Um, and afterwards, if anyone wants to kind of talk in a bit more detail about any of the science that I'm going to talk about, then please feel free to come and um, ask me. I'm happy to chat. Um, so, the title of my talk is From Molecules to Embryos and Back Again, A Scientist's Journey. So, as Mark said, I started off um, uh, originally when I was uh, my studies at King's in biochemistry, but I've morphed into many different things over the years. And hopefully in this talk, I'll get, give you a feel for kind of how I've gone from step to step and back again. Okay. So, first of all, I'll give you a little potted history. <laughs> I went to school in... Um, Brighton and Hove um, in the early 70s. I was a pretty normal kid. I was interested in cars. I was well into my football. And I had dubious fashion sense. <laughs> so I was a pretty normal kid. Um, but then um, after my A-levels, I was really lucky uh, to get into King's College, um, London, um, where I studied biochemistry. Um, and an option that was given to us um, early on in my time at King's College, an option that we were given was to do a year in industry between us, um, uh, between our second year and our final year. And I took this option because um, I thought it would be cool. And uh, I worked for a year at the research institute that Seba Geige was running in Horsham, Sussex. Seba Geige subsequently had been taken over by Novart Novartis. So I'm sure you've heard of Novartis. Um, so, for that year in industry at Seba Geige, so this was in 1986 to 1987, um, I was really lucky that I worked with a young scientist um, who herself was just starting um, working for Seba, um, Dr. Judith Brown. And she really kind of uh, 
energized me and kind of really got me excited about doing research. So this was the first time that I'd ever really had a chance to do proper research. I'd done practicals as part of my course, but this was really doing cutting edge research and it just completely kind of opened my eyes to the possibilities of what you can do. And actually, um, during this year, uh, what we did was so recently, at that point, um, an extracellular matrix protein called laminin had been cloned. And this was the early days of kind of um, gene cloning, but um, it, laminin had been cloned. Um, actually, at, the, at that time, there was just one laminin made up of three subunits. Subsequently, there were many more laminins that had been identified. And what we were doing was initially we were making fusion proteins of bits of the laminin with beta-galactosidase and making antibodies. And what they wanted to do was then see if those antibodies would interact with human laminin. Um, so we needed a source of human laminin. So what I, was do what I ended up doing was um, every two weeks I'd go to the local hospital on the day that they induced um, uh, births, uh, and I would pick up a human placenta. I would then spend the next two or three days in a cold room back at the Sibagaygi labs, mashing up the human placenta and running it over many different columns to get a pure sample of human laminin. And this is just a Kumasi stain gel um, showing um, the human laminin prep that um, I had uh, generated and compared to murine laminin, mouse laminin, which we were able to um, uh, uh, get from another, from a, a lab that was studying murine laminin. So this showed that kind of our human laminin prep had many of the, the correct size, was the correct size and had the similar subunits. And when we tested the antibodies that we'd made against these different portions of laminin, we found that these antibodies cross-reacted nicely on our human laminin samples with the different subunits of laminin. So this was just amazing. I did this over the course of the year. I was really cool because I managed to get, I was, uh, they put me on a paper which came out of that work uh, and just, you know, just showed me what you could do with research. It was just brilliant. So that was um, that. And so that meant that I kind of really got the, um, uh, really wanted to do more, and so therefore then I applied to do PhDs. Uh, and I was accepted to do a PhD at the National Institute for Medical Research, which is in Mill Hill, which is in North, or was in Mill Hill and North London. It's subsequently been um, closed and actually uh, it morphed into the Crick Institute um, and the new buildings that they have in, King, in, um, in um, uh, King's Cross. Yes, King's Cross. Anyway, so I was doing a PhD at this place. Um, you know, it's quite an imposing building um, uh, on top of a hill in North London. Uh, by day, it looks okay. By night, it got a bit more kind of scary or whatever. And it's not surprising that subsequently, it was used as the location for the Arkham Lunatic Asylum in the Batman Begins film. So um, that gives you an idea of what it was like. <laughs> So the project that I was working on there was, um, the title of my PhD was a molecular analysis of desmosomal glycoprotein 1, a component of intercellular desmosome junctions. And the person, the lab that I was working in um, was uh, run by Professor Tony McGee. And again, he's another one of these people who kind of just, you know, really kind of had, was always excited about the research, always had good ideas, and was always kind of really encouraging in getting different things done. Um, and what we were doing was, at the time, um, various cell junctions had been identified that mediated cell adhesion between um, cells in epithelia. Uh, and these cell junctions, very little was known about them. Basically, they were kind of basic. This is an electron microscope picture of a desmosome that's linking two cells. And you can see the intermediate filaments of, uh, of the cytoskeleton of the intermediate filaments, looping through these kind of desmosomal plaques, as we call them. But very little was known about the molecules that were found in these junctions, nor the molecules that were mediating the tight adhesion between these junctions. 
And it was true for many of these different cell junctions um, between uh, epithelial cells. So what they were doing, what they did in the lab, was, um, again, so this is a bit more biochemistry, a good source for desmosomes was cow's noses. So we'd occasionally, we'd go down to the local abattoir, pick up a bucket of cow's noses, bring them back to the lab, spend the afternoon shaving those, calves, those, those cow's noses to kind of get the, the keratin, uh, the, the cells off the, the cow's noses, and again, purifying these junctions. And what they were doing was they were making antibodies, or in the lab we were making antibodies against the various proteins that were found in these desmosomal cell junctions. And then I used these antibodies to screen what were called Lambda GT11 libraries. These were expression libraries, which enabled you to kind of, you could screen these libraries with a, a, an antibody against a specific antigen and use these libraries um, to kind of pull out clones that um, generate um, uh, protein sequences that these antibodies bind to. We then sequence these um, clones using kind of um, sequencing gels, which you probably, um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, uh, these are the old fashioned days where you actually kind of read the sequence yourself. Um, and basically we, we cloned these desmosomal proteins, the proteins that are mediating um, the cell adhesion um, aspects of these desmosome junctions. And what we found was really exciting at the time. Um, so when we looked at the structure of these desmosomal, glycoprote these desmosomal um, glycoproteins, so I cloned DG1, um, uh, a fellow student of mine, he cloned DG2 and 3, um, we were basically working together most of the time. But what we found is in their extracellular domains, they showed close homology to a protein or um, a couple of proteins that had been newly cloned um, just a couple of years before called cateterins. And these cateterins were, and their name was calcium dependent adhesion molecules. That's where their name come from, came from. And these molecules have been identified as some of the first true cell adhesion molecules. So to find that our desmosomal proteins showed clear homology to these cateterins was really cool. At that moment in time, um, the only three cateterins had been identified, and so we, um, by identifying our three um, desmosomal cateterins, we doubled the number of cateterins that were known at that time. And subsequently, cateterins have been identified in many different systems, in many different forms, and there are hundreds of different types of cateterins now. And they're a really important um, uh, molecule mediating cell adhesion between many different cell types within um, uh, organisms. So this was kind of really kind of exciting work and uh, again, yeah, I was lucky to be part of um, a really exciting time in that lab. Okay, so from there um, I wanted to kind of um, move on uh, and I was really lucky um, to uh, meet um, Professor Richard Hines, when he kind of visited Mill Hill, and I chatted to him, and I asked if I could come and visit, uh, come and um, uh, visit his lab, and maybe do a postdoc in his lab, and he said yes, so which is great. So he was at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT. Um, so I spent four years in Boston, which was you know brilliant and a great, great, uh, great opportunity. Uh, Richard Hines is quite well known or quite famous for discovering fibronectin uh, and also discovering or be one of the people who discovered the integrins, which um, are the adhesion molecules which mediate the adhesion between cells and the extracellular matrix. And while I was in his lab, uh, what he began to begin, what he had begun to be start doing was try and I'd look at some of these adhesion molecules in developmental systems. And so he had a project looking at Drosoph using Drosophila, uh, and so I identified a number of um, proteins that were involved in mediating the links between integrins and the cytoskeleton. There's a lot of these proteins, uh, they're called, often they're lumped together as focal contact proteins, they're found in focal contacts where uh, the integrins are found. And I I characterize a number of these focal contact proteins 
in Drosophila. Okay? And one of them in particular, Paxilin, I subsequently cloned. And this is just showing you here the, um, uh, an in-situ pattern. So this is just showing where the, the messenger RNA for Paxilin is expressed in a, in a developing Drosophila embryo. And it's quite dynamic, um, and uh, it's in a number of different places. Um, it's in a number of different cell types that are undergoing um, changes in their adhesion or changes in cell migration. And uh, so this was kind of really quite productive uh, and, and quite useful. And gave me my first real taste of trying to kind of work in a more developmental system. So following the postdoc at MIT, um, I came back to uh, the UK and I first of all came to the, um, the University of Dundee um, to the lab of Professor Birgit Lane. So Birgit Lane um, was uh, well known for studying intermediate filaments. So these are the filaments that i would mentioned before which interact with the desmosome cell junctions. Okay. And these same inter in, these intermediate filaments also interact with junctions that are called hemidesmosomes, which linked the link the intermediate filaments to extracellular matrix. So initially, I began work on a protein that was found in these hemidesmosomal junctions, a protein called plectin, and I was able to show. I'm not going to explain. Um, this too much, but I was able to show using um, actin binding assays and co-sedimentation assays that uh, the integrin alpha-6 beta-4, which is found in hemidesmosomes, um, when it's bound to plectin, it prevents the association of plectin with actin filaments. So this is kind of, it was kind of interesting. So this protein plectin was found at this point to be able to interact with both intermediate filaments in the cytoskeleton and also with actin, um, the actin cytoskeleton. Um, but when it's bound to the alpha-6 beta-4, it couldn't bind to actin, but only associated with intermediate filaments, which made sense if it's found in these hemidesmosomal junctions. So this was um, quite good. This is interesting stuff. Um, and, and it was in collaboration with a lab um, in Holland, Arnold Sonnenberg's lab, and I was on the paper that was published that kind of dealt with this um, subject, and this paper has kind of been um, cited a lot um, down through the years. It's quite, um, been quite an important paper. Okay, the thing is, I, was, I'd, my, I still wanted to do more developmental biology. I, I got excited about working with an embryo. So around this time, a new member of faculty arrived at the University of Dundee, a guy called Stefan Hoppler. And Stefan was working on wind signaling in early development. So wind signaling is a, um, a signaling pathway that had been identified in, over the previous um, uh, five or six years, um, which is involved in cell signaling, uh, in many different developmental events. It's really important in the embryo. It's also important in the adult in controlling and regulating um, cell proliferation. And what was really interesting about wind signaling was um, that an important component of the wind signaling pathway is this protein here, this red protein here, called beta-catenin. And beta-catenin had also been identified it had a second role, it had a different function. It's one of these kind of proteins that can have um, more than one function. And it played a role in mediating the links between cadherins and the actin cytoskeleton. So as well, I, was, I already knew a lot about beta-catenin as a protein. And so I was interested in how it was interacting in the wind signaling pathway. Um, so I asked Stefan if I could join his lab, and I joined his lab. Now, he was studying wind signaling in early development, and the model system that he was using was the Xenopus, or the African claw toad frog. Okay? So this is a, a Xenopus frog. Uh, they're about the size of um, the palm of your hand. Um, and there are a number of reasons why they're used as a developmental model system. They're really easy to keep. They, have, they can give us large numbers of eggs upon hormone stimulation. So all we have to do is just inject a small amount of hormone 
into a female um, Xenopus frog, and the next morning, this hormone will induce the frog to start laying her eggs. And she'll lay her eggs at any time of the year. They're not seasonal, so we can get eggs at any time of the year, and we can then use those eggs to kind of generate embryos. So you can get large numbers of eggs quite easily. The embryos then develop quickly um, outside the mother, so the embryos will just grow quite easily in a Petri dish. And between days one to five, they'll grow up into tadpoles, and these tadpoles are swimming, they have a beating heart, they have functioning eyes, so they've kind of got all the organs that, um, uh, that we want to study, um, but it happens quickly and just in the Petri dish. The embryos are also quite large, so you've all seen frog spawn in, in a, a pond, and the eggs are quite large, the embryos are quite large, they're easy to kind of manipulate, um, and we can also kind of do lots of gene function studies. So we can overexpress genes of interest. Um, we can knock down genes of interest. Um, and more recently, we're using CRISPR-Cas gene editing techniques um, on these Xenopus embryos quite easily. Uh, and I'll also talk a little bit about also we can do these um, what we call chemical screens um, very easily because we can generate hundreds of embryos quite easily. And I'll come back to that. So, just for some people, uh, most, uh, hopefully most people will hear and will know, but I just want to kind of make it clear what I mean by developmental biology. So, developmental biology studies how a fertilized egg gives rise to a multicellular organism, okay? And it's, it's often called the study of controlled growth, okay? So this is really you know, how an embryo forms from a fertilized egg to a free-swimming tadpole, and it happens, it works 99.9% .9 of the time in hundreds of embryos, but it's really exquisitely regulated at every point during that process. So it's amazing that it works so well all the time, uh, and we're, what we're trying to do is understand what's happening during those processes. And I'll come back to this in a bit more time in, the, in a second. So this is just showing you here uh, an early Xenopus embryo undergoing cleavage to a blastular stage and then undergoing gastrulation, what we call gastrulation and neurulation to form an embryo with the beginnings of a head here and the beginnings of a tail here. So in Stefan's lab, um, as I said, he was interested in wind signaling. The wind signaling pathway had been, uh, be was beginning to be identified, and just, bef just before Stefan arrived, the receptors that wind's bound to on the cell surface had just been identified, and they were found to be a family of proteins called the frizzles. So the first thing I did was I went and cloned a bunch of frizzles from Xenopus embryos, and these are just showing, and two in particular, I then focused on Fizzle 7 and Fizzle 9 and 10. And these are in situ, whole mount in situ um, pictures, just showing where and when these particular frizzles are expressed during development. Okay, so this Fizzle 7 is expressed in a gastrula stage embryo, and then you can see expression here in a neural stage embryo, uh, in the trunk, in what we call the heart field. So these are cells that are migrating to form the heart, which will form just here. Uh, it's expressed in the tail bud uh, embryo. Uh, and here, a bit later on, a tadpole stage embryo, you can see there's expression in the eye, in different structures in the head, in the heart, and in the tail bud region. And here you can see it's even expressed in what we call the pronephric duct. So it's in the beginning, the rudimentary beginnings of the um, embryonic kidney. So it's expressed dynamically in many different stages of development. And, but to show how they could be really different from each, each other, Fizzled 9 and 10 um, was more restricted in expression. So it's, it was expression was mostly in the neural tube early on in the embryo's development. And then a bit later on in the tadpole, that expression in the neural tube is restricted to the midbrain and the hindbrain of the embryo. So these fizzles had quite dynamic and different expression patterns, and they were mediating different kinds of wind signals. So um, there was a lot to try and begin to kind of um, try and understand. 
Um, we did some functional experiments. I did some functional experiments when I was in Stefan's lab. lab. So what we were doing is we were using um, heat shock proteins um, and heat shock constructs, which I developed in his lab, which meant that we could turn on uh, using just a, a small heat shock to the embryos, which didn't harm the embryos, but this heat shock would turn on um, a plasmid that we um, uh, 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 injected into the embryo, meaning that we could turn on expression of and overexpress a gene of interest at any time during development. And when we heat shocked at this stage, at stage 13, which is an earlier stage, uh, these embryos then are allowed to develop to the tadpole stage. And you can see these, the embryos on the bottom here, the embryos that were heat shocked at different stages. And this is a, um, a, a phenotype which said to us that the frizzle 7 was affecting the gastrulation of the embryo. Because you've got a normal head that's formed and a pretty normal tail that's formed. But the embryo hasn't extended. So it hasn't undergone correct gastrulation during early development. Okay, so you know, using these kinds of experiments, we were able to kind of, then, you know, we were able to say that Frizzle Seven is playing a role in these early gastrulation movements, and we went on to show that it plays a role in what we call convergent extension movements that um, uh, occur during gastrulation. But I'm not going to go into that that kind of detail here. So. We've identified different fizzles. We begin to kind of give them functions as well during early development. So around this time, I looked for um, opportunities to start up my own lab. Uh, and I was um, very lucky to be offered an opportunity to have a lectureship here at the University of East Anglia. Um, along with many other people, I had to kind of figure out where exactly the University of Engli East Anglia was. And this is a slide that I use in nearly all the talks which I give outside of UEA, just to make clear to people that they know where UEA is. And one of the things that I was thinking about at the time, uh, and I'd always kind of begun to, been thinking about it, but I'd never really managed to kind of do much with it, was the fact that, okay, understanding or understanding development is really cool, it's fun, but what's the point of it? Okay, now the point of it is this, and this is a definition for what is cancer. This, is, this was on the Marie Curie Cancer Care um, website at the time. And the statement was, cancer develops when cells start to divide at the wrong time and in the wrong place, then continue to divide, to divide and invade nearby tissues and organs. It is this uncontrolled growth of cells that causes a tumor, okay? And if you remember the definition of developmental biology, the def def definition of development is controlled growth. And it was not surprising that around this time, a number of genes that have been shown to be playing a role in development were found to be mutated in a number of different cancers. Okay? So it was beginning to see that there was links. You know, the cells, that, the, the, the genes and proteins that are controlling development if they're mutated in different ways, then they can lead to cancer. Okay, so this was something that I was really interested in and wanted to try and make the most of. So initially, um, when I first came down here, um, I started work on Fizzle 7, and I'd always been intrigued by the expression pattern of this particular embryo here. So this is a, a, a neural stage Xenopus embryo. Um, like I said, this is the heart field. But this strong expression here is the migrating neural crest. Okay? So, what is the neural crest? The neural crest are a multipotent embryonic cell type which form at the border between the neural plate and the ectoderm in the developing embryo. And as the neural plate folds up to form the neural tube, the neural crest region here comes towards the dorsal side of the neural tube. And then the neural crest cells in this region undergo what's called an epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So they change from being quite epithelial-like and being strongly adherent to each other to become more mesenchymal and more migratory. And they migrate over the whole of the embryo. And they give rise to many different cell types 
over the embryo. So in the head, they give rise to some of the neurons and glia of the cranial ganglia, the cartilage and bone in your face, uh, and a lot of the connective tissue in the head. In the trunk, they give rise to the adrenal medulla, which is part of the adrenal gland, uh, the sensory neurons and glia, so much of your um, peripheral nervous system, and they also give rise to the pigment cells in your skin. So the pigment cells in our skin originally derived from the neural crest when we were embryos. So this is just showing here, and so this, and so this was a really interesting cell type. So um, it undergoes, it's multipotent, it undergoes this epithelial mesenchymal transition, it can become very migratory, almost invasive-like, so you know, it has properties that are kind of similar to cancer cells. So we started working on this in more detail. I just want to kind of point out here, this is a control embryo, and you can see the pigment cells that have come originally, originated from the um, neural crest. So the pigment cells originate on the dorsal side of the neural tube, just here, but then they migrate to the side of the embryo, here in the trunk, and to the bottom underneath of the tail, okay? So we did functional. So we can do a standard kind of um, knock out or knock down experiment that you can do with Xenopus, which is um, relatively easy to do, is using morpholinos. So these are antisense oligonucleotides, and we can use these to knock down a gene of interest. Um, so this is a control embryo, and it's been um, uh, um, hybridized, or it's showing the expression pattern of protein called SOX10, which is a known protein found only in your, uh, found in your crest at this early stage. So this pattern here, this is the expression of SOX10 in the neural crest, okay? In our experiments, we can, in, the, uh, in an early stage embryo, we can inject, for instance, a Xenopus Fizzle 7 morpholino. So this is an antisense oligonucleotide, which knocks down the Fizzle 7 um, in, the, in the embryo. And if we inject it just on one side, what we and then do in situ for SOX10, we can see that on the injected side, we've got a loss of SOX10. So inhibit, inhibiting Fizzle 7 or knocking down Fizzle 7 means that you get a loss of neural crest. And that suggests that Fizzle 7 is required for neural crest development. So this is a marker for the early neural crest, but it also you see the same um, thing if you let the embryos develop. Um, what you find is um, this is um, a set of embryos that have been injected with Fizzle 7 morpholino, and you can see that compared to the control embryos, you've got a loss of pigment cells on the, on the em in the embryo. Okay? So you've inhibited the neural crest development, and you've therefore inhibited um, pigment cells. Okay, so that was the kind of developmental stuff that we were doing in the lab, um, which was were fun and we were kind of getting the lab up and running. Uh, and then one day, um, a guy from chemistry, Professor Rob Field, wandered into the lab and he had a paper in his hand which uh, he'd been reading and he thought was really interesting and he wanted to come and talk to us about. So this was this paper from the Schreiber lab in uh, Harvard. Um, and the title was Small Molecule Developmental Screens Reveal the Logic and Timing of Vertebrate Development. And basically what they'd done is this lab worked with zebrafish, and they'd basically taken zebrafish embryos, and they'd taken a library of a thousand compounds, and they'd put these compounds individually onto the fish embryos, and they'd identified a bunch of compounds which affected the development of the zebrafish embryos. Okay, so it's a very simple experiment, but really kind of quite, um, uh, it showed that the possibilities of something which people hadn't really thought about too much at the time. But you could easily kind of screen hundreds or thousands of compounds against an embryo and look for developmental phenotypes. So we thought, well, can we try and do this in, in the, uh, with Xenopus? And... This is the basic assay that we set up over the, um, uh, and I should mention actually also, so with um, Rob, we were able to apply for uh, a one-year discipline hopping um, MRC award, which meant that Rob could take time out from chemistry 
um, and come and work in the lab for a year just developing this assay. And what we did, what we were able to do, was we could take 96 well plates, we'd array compounds in these plates, and then we'd add up to five embryos to each well of the plate, let the embryos develop over two or three days, and then look at the embryos, or look at the tadpoles that have um, grown in these wells. So this is a well containing five tadpoles, and this is a control well, and you can clearly see um, the eyes of the tadpoles, and you can clearly see the pigment pattern down the side of the tadpole. Now, pigment was something really easy to see, and so this was what we used for our screen. Just, we just looked down the microscope and see whether or not we had any changes in pigment pattern in the embryos. And you can see here some examples. This is a very clear example. In this particular well, um, the compound has, um, the, the embryos have formed, but with no pigment. So you've blocked the formation of pigment. So this particular compound has blocked the formation of pigment in these cells. And it's harder to see maybe, but in these wells here, you, and this one here, there are changes in the pattern of pigmentation compared to the, um, to the control well. And this is just showing you here some of the examples of some of these different pigment patterns that we found. So we've screened well over 6,000 compounds now. Um, and we got initially quite a few, and we got, because of the nature of our screen, we've got a lot of um, compounds that affected pigmentation. So this is an example here where you've got a, a compound that's completely blocked um, formation of pigment. Another set of compounds would block pigment formation, but not so much in the eye. We have um, uh, compounds such as this, these, a set of compounds like this one here, where the pigment cells have formed, and they've actually uh, from the neural crest, and they've actually migrated to the correct regions of the embryo. But the cells, instead of becoming dendritic, like normal pigment cells, they remain rounded up and quite small. So we've got found a compound that's basically affecting cell shape, changing cell, cell shape. Um, we also found compounds that affected um, that, uh, patterning, affected development. So this is kind of a shortened embryo, similar to the, some of those frizzled embryos that I showed you a bit earlier. So clearly this the compound is affecting the normal development of the embryo. We found some compounds that, which were easy to score, which affected eye development. And so we were able to identify some of those. Um, this embryo here, you can see here, there's some edema here. So this is where the heart is normally forming. So we found a whole set of compounds that gave us edema. And so these compounds are affecting the development of the vasculature in these embryos. Okay. We also found a bunch of compounds which just led to general toxicity that often would give us blistering of the embryo or the embryos would die or just to stop growing and stuff. So we had compounds which just affect, seem to kind of just kill the embryo or be toxic for the embryo. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But we also found a set of compounds which affected um, the pigment pattern, um, similar to this one here, where you can see actually the pigment pattern is a little bit segmented along the top of the, the embryo. And we had a, a whole bunch of different compounds which affected the pigment pattern either by causing this segmentation effect or by just completely blocking um, the formation of the, or the, the, the uh, migration of the pigment cells from the top of the neural tube here to the side of the embryo and to the underneath of the tail. So these particular compounds are affecting the migration of the neural crest of the pigment cells to different regions of the body. So they're affecting cell migration. And one of these compounds, this one here, we went on to show was an actual inhibitor of matrix metalloproteinases. So there were a number of groups that were working at UEA at the time on matrix metalloproteinases. This was a family of proteins, the secreted proteins that um, uh, are involved in um, regulating cell migration. 
Okay, so they really play a close role in cell migration. They're also shown to be upregulated and downregulated in many different cancers. Okay, so this was kind of quite interesting and novel to find this, and it also vindicated what we were doing, actually, because it showed that we could find interesting molecules through this kind of screening procedure that we were using. Um, so we followed up in more detail this particular compound here. It seemed to block um, neural crest migration or pigment cell development. And when we looked at the structure of this compound, NSC210627, this is the structure of it. And when you did chemoinformatic analysis with it, you were able to show that um, this portion of the molecule here was the same or very similar to this compound, Brequinar. Now, Brequinar was a known inhibitor of an enzyme called dihydroorotate dehydrogenase. So this enzyme, DODH, um, uh, uh, is involved in the um, formation of orotate from DH, dihydroorotate, and this is part of the um, pyridine biosynthesis pathway. So this is the synthesis pathway to kind of generate um, CTP and TT TTP in the cell. And so this is kind of um, uh, important uh, to kind of for um, uh, generating nucleotides to allow for correct RNA transcription and for DNA replication to occur within the cell. So Brequinar is similar to instructed to our particular compound. And um, Brequinar is known to inhibit DODH. Another molecule that was an inhibitor of DODH was a molecule called leflunamide. Structurally, it's not similar at all to Brequinol or our own compound, but it does inhibit DODH. So the idea was, if our compound is generating the pigment cell phenotype by inhibiting DODH, if we treated embryos with leflunamide, would we see the same phenotype? And when we did that, we found that to be the case. So you can hear this embryo here treated with leflunamide. You've got a, um, a loss of the pigment cells on the side of the embryo. So that you're inhibiting the pigment cell development and migration. And we were doing this work in collaboration with Lenzon's lab in Harvard, and they were working with zebrafish. Uh, and they added leflunamide to zebrafish embryos at an earlier stage than when we were adding our leflunamide to our embryos. And what they could see was a clear block in pigment cell development. So you've got a total loss of pigment cells. So we looked at this in more detail and we treated embryos with leflunamide earlier on in development uh, and we were able to show similar to um, the Zon lab that um, leflunamide could block um, neural crest development. So this is control. So this is looking at a protein called CMIC or a gene called CMIC and SOX10. And if you treated the embryos with leflunamide, you'd get a loss um, in uh, signals for these proteins uh, or these genes. Okay, so leflunamide affects specification of the neural crest. Um, and we were interested in CMIC in particular because CMIC um, is a known proto-oncogene. So it's involved in many different kinds of cancers uh, and is also a, a, a protein that's been shown to be crucial for neural crest, early neural crest development. And to cut a long story short, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but we were able to show that CMIC is a, a, um, what we call a pause gene early in development. So CMIC is crucial for neural crest development you need activation of CMIC protein to then turn on expression of many downstream genes, such as, for instance, SOX10, um, to activate the neural crest pathway. Okay? Uh, and we did a bunch of experiments. We were looking at genes that um, evolved, that are involved in transcriptional elongation. So I said that the, um, by inhibiting pyrimidine biosynthesis, you're decreasing the pool of nucleotides within the cell. And if you try then to get a cell to undergo a burst of RNA transcription, if you've limited, limited the pool of nucleotides, then you're going to block this process. Okay? And what we showed, this is what's happening 
with respect to neural crest, with respect to CMIC. CMIC is a pause gene. You have active CMIC po uh, protein um, or active CMIC. Sorry, let me just say this again. Um, the CMIC gene has RNA polymerase bound to the promoter region of CMIC. But it's only at a certain point in development that you get a release of this RNA polymerase 2 that's bound to the CMIC promoter to generate the CMIC transcript. And if you inhibit the pyrimidine um, pool within those cells, then you can block this process. Okay? And, if, and this prevents then neural crest formation in these cells. I probably haven't described it as well as I could. So this is an experiment here just showing us um, that CDK9 is a, a protein that's involved in this process of transcriptional elongation. And if we inhibit CDK9 morpholino, uh, using a CDK9 morpholino, we can block SOX10 expression. If we then add CMIC RNA, to um, these embryos, we can overcome this um, block in neural crest formation, and so CMIC can actually rescue this effect. Okay? So it basically was showing that CMIC is an important regular regulator of early neural crest development, and it was in this pause state ready to, um, to work at a certain point in development. Okay? I probably haven't described it brilliantly, but um, this got us interested in looking at um, the regulation of neural crest in more detail. And recently, we've been doing experiments trying to identify enhancer regions or regulatory regions that um, control um, aspects of uh, neural crest development. And we've been using a method called ATAC-seq. I'm not going to go into detail about how it works, but what it basically does is it identifies open regions of chromatin within cells, uh, and these open regions of chromatin could be corresponding to promoter regions, active promoters or active enhancers within those cells. And so this is a way to identify enhancer regions or regulatory regions within um, cells or within embryos. And we've used ATAC-seq to identify uh, regulatory regions which can... Um, correspond to regulation of the neural crest. So this is a particular enhancer region that we've identified, and when we hook this enhancer region up to GFP, green fluorescent protein, we can see expression of the GFP in early neural crest and in migrating neural crest. And this enhancer region actually has a binding site for the CMIC um, protein as well. So this shows us that we're identifying these kind of regulatory regions. We can begin to then use these to try and understand the regulation of neural crest development in more detail. Okay. We're also interested in looking at the regulation of neural crest more, in more detail using um, other um, uh, regulatory um, systems. And in particular, we're interested in microRNAs. So these are small... Um, small um, 22 to 24 nucleotide long pieces of RNA, which um, have been shown in recent years to play important roles in regulating um, RNA uh, levels within cells. And we identified microRNAs that are expressed in neural crest cells. So these two in particular, 219 and 196. And when we use a morpholino, against the 219 or 196. If so if we knock down the levels of these microRNAs in the early embryo, we can show using our standard SOX10 assay that you get a loss of SOX10. So this shows that these microRNAs are crucial for regulating um, neural crest development. Okay, so that's another area of research that we're actively um, uh, looking at at the moment. Uh, we've recently used um, CRISPR gene editing, so this is um, uh, a new way of kind of knocking out um, genes of interest within cells and within, within embryos, and we've developed um, a really nice, simple um, system to snip out 
a microRNA from the genome. So we use two guide RNAs, which just then will snip out the microRNA and to, leading to a knockout of that particular microRNA. And again, we see um, a loss of SOX10 expression in these embryos. So we're using this kind of method to understand, my, look at more microRNAs and try and understand microRNA function in your crest in more detail. Okay, so that's the, the developmental biology. That's the stuff that we're really interested in from a developmental biology point of view. I did talk about earlier how um, you can link developmental biology with cancer, cancer's uncontrolled growth. Now, pigment cells um, in our skin are also called melanocytes, and if you have a mutation in pigment cells, this can lead to melanoma cancer, which is one of the most um, dangerous forms of skin cancer. And with our screens, we identified lots of molecules that seem to affect pigment cell development in the early embryo, and it was quite easy to then test these molecules the, on um, cells, melanoma cells grown in culture, to see whether or not these molecules could affect the growth of the melanoma cells. You know, they're, they're derived from pigment cells. Can they affect the growth of melanoma cells? And the flunamide was one of these molecules which had an effect. Uh, here, this is increasing concentrations of the flunamide, and, you can see, and these are three different melanoma cell lines. And with increasing concentrations of leflunamide, you get a decrease in cell viability. Now, the Zon Lab, who we were, in, who we were collaborating with, um, they then did mouse xenograft assays. So basically, they injected human melanoma cells into um, the leg of a mouse. These human melanoma cells would then form a tumor on the side of the mouse. And if you treated those mice with leflunamide, actually inhib it inhibited the growth of the melanoma. Uh, Vemorafenib was a molecule, was a drug that came out around that time, which would, had been developed um, to target melanoma cancers and could inhibit melanoma growth as well. And when, and so Vemorafenib was um, interacted um, with the RAS. MAP kinase signaling pathway inhibited a protein called BRAF in this pathway to um, therefore uh, inhibit the melanoma growth. And when you treated these mice with both vemorafenib and leflunamide together, you got a complete loss of tumor growth. So suggesting that combinatorially, you got a kind of an added response. And we, in our lab, with um, the help of Stephen Robinson, we um, also tested leflunamide with another molecule which inhibited um, the MEK kinase in this same pathway, it's a molecule called selametinib. So on its own, selametinib could inhibit tumor growth. But when we treated the tumors or the mice with a combination of leflunamide and selametinib, so the concentration of leflunamide we used was quite low. So on its own, it didn't really um, uh, uh, inhibit the tumor growth, but when we added the flunamide and selametinib, you got a synergistic response. So you got an actual, almost um, a really decreased tumor growth. Okay, suggesting that they kind of work together um, to inhibit tumor growth. So this was a great. Um, so this kind of validated what we've been doing. We've been playing around with tadpoles, just putting molecules onto tadpoles, but now we've kind of shown that you can kind of take these kind of, this kind of work and have a real biomedical um, application come from it, um, potentially leading to kind of new treatments for cancer. So this kind of showed that this kind of methodology was really kind of um, justified. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the one of the other things that we'd identified when we did our, toxic, our, our, our screens, it was we identified molecules that actually just led to general toxicity. So molecules that would just inhibit the growth of the embryo or kind of gave us kind of these kind of blistering effects um, or just messed up the embryo. Um, and I thought maybe this was um, something that we could kind of make, um, uh, could utilize to help with um, a problem that's been identified for many years 
in the drug development pathway. So the drug, drugs from early discovery through to um, final marketing and uh, going on the market, it, the process can take many years, can take 10 to 15 years, and is really expensive. And many of the compounds that are initially identified as potential drugs kind of fall away as this process develops. They fall away during preclinical development and then in through clinical development. Okay? So what we were seeing is we were finding some compounds that actually were toxic to the embryos. So maybe if we treated embryos with compounds that had come from the initial drug discovery programs, which are often either biochemical assays or cell-based assays, if we tested those compounds um, on our embryos, could we flag up potentially toxic compounds before you got into the more expensive mouse experiments or if they, before they kind of gone a lot further down the road in the development pipeline? Could we flag these things up uh, um, earlier, at an earlier point in this, in this um, pathway? And we've been developing assays to do this, to look at this, um, and we've shown that um, Xenopus embryos, if you treat them with drug, drugs that are known to cause um, liver toxicity, such as paracetamol, the embryos will react in the same way that mice or humans will react. You, you, you do, we can clearly show liver toxicity. So this suggests that maybe we can, if we're kind of screen compounds that come out, um, we can look for other compounds. If they're going to cause hepatotoxicity or liver toxicity in similar ways, we can maybe identify them at an early stage in the pipeline. Um, and at the moment, I have a student, Saskia, who is um, developing assays to look at cardiotoxicity as well. Okay? So, um, so we're trying to develop this and you know, maybe try and get some of the drug companies interested in some of these assays and maybe insert these assays into their developmental pipelines to try and see whether or not um, we can kind of flag up potential toxic compounds at an earlier stage in the process. Right, okay. So that's kind of giving you a flavor of what I've done in the past and what the lab has been doing. Currently, this is the, my current lab, um, and these are some of the projects that are going on in the lab. So. I'm still interested in the role of wind signaling in early development, and we have a couple of projects, and these have um, been started in collaboration with John Griffin, who was a member of faculty here who's just recently um, left, and we're going to continue these projects. So looking at um, RepGAF5 in early Xenopus development, and this is a project, the AGMO project, which we're just currently recruiting for. Um, and uh, Irina uh, is the postdoc who's working on the RAPGEF5 project. Um, we're continuing in our microRNA projects, uh, and Marco here is, um, he's continuing the, the microRNA work. Um, we're continuing our looking for um, regulatory sequences involved in Eurocrest development. So this is the genomics, the ATAC-seq project, and so Santosh and Claudia are working on this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the neural crest can give rise to um, the adrenal medulla in the adrenal gland. And so we have a project um, that Amy is uh, running looking at the development of the adrenal gland in the Xenopus embryo. And Saskia here is um, uh, continuing the, um, the toxicology project. So this is just showing you here a beating heart in the Xenopus embryo. We can take movies of this quite easily, and we can generate quite nicely heart rates. And so this is a nice, easy way to kind of look for molecules that cause arrhythmias or changes in heart rate, cardiotoxicity. It's a very simple assay, and, and Saskia is working on that. So that's the current lab. I think I want to finish with the most important couple of slides um, of all the people who've kind of done the work down through the years. So when I started my lab, I started off with a PhD student, Satya, and a postdoc, Mohammed. They helped me get the lab up and running. And since then, I've had just brilliant students and postdocs who've kind of done so much, of, well, done most of the work that I've presented here. Um, 
So Katie, she um, did the initial hepatotoxicity work. Um, Simon was a bioinformatician in the lab. Matt Tomlinson was a great student who um, did all the kind of early um, chemical screens that I presented um, once Rob Field um, went back to um, chemistry. Uh, who else? Tim Grocott, he was in the lab for a while um, playing with Xenopus tadpoles and is now a member of faculty here. Um, Carla Garcia Morales um, worked on my Fizzle 10 project. Uh, Joe um, worked on um, uh, Fizzle 7 along with Mohammed. Um, Vicky is in the audience here, so she did a, um, a lot of the work with lefunamide and looking at the regulation, looking at the, f the effect of lefunamide on neural crest development. Um, uh, at, Marta um, has done some of the early ATAC, did the early ATAC work that we kind of uh, that I presented. Uh, Kim, she did a lot of the um, the cancer work with the selametinib um, experiments. Uh, and Nicole and Alice. So Nicole started off the microRNA project in the lab, and Alice um, continued the microRNA project and developed the CRISPR-Cas technique um, for snipping out microRNAs that I showed you. So it's just a lot of people here. There's people, some uh, members of the lab who um, I couldn't find photographs for, so Amanda, um, Michael, Catherine. There are people down through the years at UEA, so many people at UEA who've kind of collaborated with me or, or, or um, helped me in different ways. Um, I can't mention all the names, but hopefully people can see some of the names here. And I've had collaborators um, from outside of UEA who've helped me um, uh, or helped us with different projects and, and helped get projects up and running. I have to mention Richard White in Lenzon's lab who um, did a lot of the um, work with early work with lefunamide. And these are some of the funders that have funded me down through the years. Again, I've kind of been really lucky to get funding from a number of different places. The BBSRC has been really great in um, funding a lot of our developmental work. Um, I've had case studentships from Pfizer, Unilever, and AstraZeneca, which have helped us develop our toxicology work and our chemical screens. Um, I've also had a bunch of funding down through the years from the EU, um, uh, which has kind of really been great for the lab. Uh, and I currently have two students um, funded by the EU in my lab at the moment. So that's Marco and Amy. Um, I have to kind of, I should acknowledge the um, Pamela Salter, who in my early years at UEA, um, you know, she was, you know, she used to come by with her boxes of flapjacks and kind of talk to us. And, and she always provided small amounts of money to help us get our little projects up and running. Um, so they were really good. And various other, Big C, the NC3Rs, the medical MRC. I've even had funding from the John Innes Center, even though you think of them as plant-based. You know, they, again, they were interested in some of our chemical screens that we were doing. So I've been lucky with the funding. And most important now, I just want to kind of mention Andrea. So Andrea, we met when we were doing our PhDs at Mill Hill. Um, we went to Boston together. This is us in 1994 in Boston. She's still with me. She's a great, I think, gifted scientist. And she's kind of helped and supported me in everything that I've done down through the years. And yeah, no words. And the frogs. Thank you for the frogs. And, and that's it. So I hope that's been enjoyable. How are we doing? Um, All right, so next step. So, Grant, thanks, thanks for that. That was a, a, an amazing uh, trip from, uh, I've written down here, from bad fashion through chopping up human placenta via the going to the Arkham Asylum and then chopping up cows' noses. Interesting early career, yeah. Uh, and then, and, and finally to the toads, when we heard about the clones, cloning of frizzles, 
uh, the way that uh, developmental biology can be used to inform us about cancer, then to the area of drug screening and finding new drug molecules. The only time I've ever given Grant any of our molecules, we killed all the tadpoles. Um, and, and then the, the, uh, the tour de force, really, of finding new ways of using an old drug in the, clen in the case of luflunamide. Um, so, and, and then, and now the toxicity studies as, as well, which would be, I think, a huge, uh, hugely useful for, uh, for drug development. So I think that was a, a, a fantastic um, uh, tour um, through, uh, through Grant's career and, and some amazing science. And I'm now I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So if anybody has any questions. Vicky. You just um, wait for the microphone so that the people on the... Sorry, I should have oh, said I've that. I've got a microphone, I can say a bit louder. Um, what is happening with lafudamide now? Um, are people using it as a treatment commonly? They're not using it as a treatment. Um, I think because around the same time uh, as we were finding um, lafudamide and remorafenib and selametinib, um, a lot of the immunotherapies that were also identified at the same time, but which work in a very different way, these were coming online. And these have kind of... Uh, are doing uh, are being used more in the clinic as well. But what is really interesting is that um, other cancers associated with the neural crest, such as neuroblastomas uh, and a number of other different cancers, they've also been found to be sensitive to lefunamide. Okay, so lefunamide, or in, in, not just lefunamide, to brequinar, an inhibition of the pyrimidine biosynthesis pathway, seems to really be crucial for many of these cell types that are derived from the neural crest. And that there is a lot still happening in other cancers. So, you know, it's, I think there's the option, the possibilities are there. Very cool. Any other questions? Let's start from you. Um, hi. Uh, when you were starting to do the uh, molecular screens, how much of any of this were you predicting um, could it could be used for? Or was it all just seeing what would come out of it? We were... I, it was hard to say. We, that, that initial Schreiber paper had suggested that we might be able to see something, but we didn't really know what we were going to see. And I still remember the day in the lab that um, Matt uh, Tomlinson, he showed me those embryos which had that segmented, that stripy pattern. I still remember the day he showed me that. And I thought, cool, this is really cool because we've got a clear phenotype, really obvious to see. To my mind, with, with my kind of cell adhesion, cell migration hat on, I could immediately see that this was affecting cell migration. And so that, to, to me, thought, this is great, we've got it. Um, we've got something now that we can kind of really get our teeth into. So that kind of showed that it can, it can then do something. So we were uncertain to begin with, which is why Rob had come down and why we got this, we were lucky, we got this one year, just discipline hopper, just kind of look-see kind of grant, and it, it seemed to bear fruit. Okay. Thank you. It's not really a scientific question, but I just wondered how, if Brexit had impacted on your ability to attract young European scientists to your lab, because you seem to be benefiting a lot from, from their expertise. Um, it, I was very lucky. The, the, the current grant that we got, we got that just before Brexit happened, and, and the students started kind of Subsequent, so we got the grant just before the Brexit occurred, and then the students have come. Um, uh, Amy and Marco are great. They, they've come here, and it's really great. And one of the things about this particular grant that we have is you can only recruit students from another European country. So I couldn't recruit any UK students for this particular grant. It had to be kind of European students. Um, so, yeah, they were almost forced to come here. <laughs> but But... The EU grants have been really useful. It's drying up. I, my feeling is that it's, it's becoming more, harder and harder to get funding from the EU. The government is not 
um, uh, is not standing by some of the promises that it made with Brexit. So it's not kind of, um, it kind of always said that it would maintain and um, maintain our funding of um, scientific research within the EU and be part of the EU scientific research. But now that's becoming a hostage to the fortune with respect to the negotiations about the island problems, uh, with the problems of Northern Ireland. So funding for um, getting, I think, more funding from the EU is becoming more and more difficult. Um, so I'm probably not going to... And, and European countries, other people, other labs in Europe, they're less inclined to invite us onto their grant applications because they know it's going to cause, it's going to potentially cause that flag problem. So it is a problem. Okay, if there aren't any further questions, I'd like to invite you to join Grant for a drink outside. Uh, there should be some, uh, some uh, drinks outside. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I'd like to invite you to give him another round of applause. Thank you.